In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We bless your name. We bless your name because we know that you are a great God, a God of decency and a God of order. You are not a God of confusion. And when you call your people, you call them into a kind of life that will please you. And therefore, Lord, we pray that this morning, our life and everything we do will be pleasing unto you in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, you give us the courage and the strength. And you give us the conviction, you give us the boldness to be able to declare your truth without fear and without favor in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to stand by your word and to stand with your word, so that, Lord, we'll be able to go the straight path that you lay before us in Jesus' name. Be with us today, Lord, energize us, empower us, embolden us, strengthen us, that we will be able to do all that you have called us to do in the world, in our nations, in our continent, at this time, in Jesus' name. We bless you today because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can see that. We're looking at the word of God once again. This is Acts of the Apostles. And we're looking at chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. I'm reading to you from verse 13 over there. It says, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What a statement. And what a revelation that these people took note of the boldness and the courage of these apostles and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that made them to say, the only person that could train them like this to have this kind of boldness and this kind of courage and conviction is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, you know, Jesus Christ came and when he appeared before them and he touched them as one having authority. And he said, you had this before and now this is what I tell you. And even when they persecuted him, and even though they were going to kill him, he still stood by what he said, that he is the Son of God. He referred to the Old Testament, he convinced them, he convicted them, and he saw his boldness, even at the point of death. And now when they now saw these disciples, and they said, we're telling you, you'll be preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we, we tell you not to do this. And they said, this is what we're going to do. They saw their boldness. They took knowledge of them, that these are being with Christ. They'll take knowledge of you. They'll notice you, that you are being with Christ, and that he has touched your life. He has converted you. He has recreated you. He has done something that no other person can do. They will know that this must be a follower of Jesus Christ because no other person can raise up a bold person of courage and conviction like this. But the surprising thing, after they demonstrated this boldness, uh, let, me, let me read verse 18. It says, And they called them, and they commanded them not to speak at all, no teach in the name of Jesus. Understand, these people that commanded them, they killed the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were telling these people, hey, look at this, we killed even your master. We killed even the one you are trying to follow. And if we could do that to your head, don't you see we can do something to you, even though they knew that, that these people were powerful and there was no power against their power. Yet, it says in verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak. They tell us not to speak, but we cannot but speak. The things which we have seen, and the things which we have heard, they said we are going to still emphasize what they have seen, and what they have heard, because they had that boldness and courage. Isn't it surprising what they came to pray? See what they still prayed for. They had some boldness already, and they wanted more. And thank God you have some boldness already, and you want more. I said you want more. 
if you have been ministering for some time, you're preaching in that place, and you're preaching in that place, and you've confronted those powers of darkness, and those powers of evil, where you're coming from. And now, we come to the Congress again, say they're talking about boldness, praise the Lord, I have it already. The disciples had that already. Those apostles had that already. And see their prayer, as they began to pray, reading from verse 24 of that same chapter. And when they had that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouths of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined things. things. The kings of the earth stood up. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, his anointed. For the truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with what? All boldness, they said. We just, just need one branch of boldness, one aspect of boldness, one area of boldness, that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They had some boldness. They were praying for more. They were praying for all kinds of boldness. The persecution that the early church had begun, had uh, gone through, and the believers and the leaders, what they saw, they saw the need of more strength and more steadfastness. The Lord had watched his own disciples that they would be persecuted, but while he was still with them on earth, they did not experience much of that persecution. But the constitution now arose and they were focused on the people. Because Christ, which who they persecuted before, he had gone, he had left. But now he had told them they will deliver you to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And they sh and ye shall be brought before the governors and the kings for my sake. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Think about that. He said, the hatred is not just going to come from this section or that section or that section. All men, all the sections of society, they're going to show that hatred and that bitterness they had against me. They'll show it to you and they show it against you. And the Lord also assured them that the persecution will not destroy the church. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell with all the persecution, all the pressure, will not prevail against it. And the more they were persecuted, the more the church would grow and multiply. It happened to them like it happened to the children of Israel. That the regal and the adverse situation that those Egyptians laid over them did not destroy them. Look at this in Exodus chapter 1. Persecution does not destroy the true church. It makes the true church strong vibrant, courageous, and bold. In Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1, I read there from verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. I said the more they multiplied and grew. And I've been reading the uh, church, about the church in one area of the world, a large, large continent of the world, and their population goes beyond just, you know, 100 million and 200 million, 500 million. It goes beyond 1 billion. And when the church began to suffer persecution in that place, there were just a few millions in the country. But now they run into millions and millions and millions of people because the persecution did not destroy them. It developed them, gave them some spinal cord and some backbone, and they had some heart to be able to face. What the Lord had called them for. The same thing with the early church. The same thing with the people of Israel. Uh, the persecution brought the church together. The persecution made them to pray. The persecution made them to see the power of God in their lives. The persecution brought strength, the strength to stand, and to remain faithful in their calling to preach 
at the gospel and also to be able to win others. You would have thought that people were only away from that church because of persecution, but no. The persecution made more people to want to say, these people have something in them. And because of what they had in them, they were going to join. And they were really born again. And only sincere people joined them because you couldn't just be fake and you couldn't be counterfeit and join a persecuted group like that. It pushed the church and purified the church and made their faith and resolve strong. We're looking at three points. Number one, the persecution of believers and the preachers. The persecution of the believers and the preachers. We're looking at it from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, you'll see the persecution that they laid upon them. It says in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, I'm reading there from verse 1. Acts, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, and As they speak unto the people, the priests and the captain of the multitude of the temple, and the Sadducees that came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people. That's the reason for the persecution. If they were just quiet, and they were afraid, and they stayed in the, inside their rooms, there was no witnessing, there was no preaching, there was no getting people out of darkness into the light, and no getting them out of the hand of Satan, onto the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. If they didn't do anything like that, there will be no persecution. It was the ministry. It was the teaching, it was the preaching, it was the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was bringing them to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, for eternal life, preparing them for heaven. That's what brought the persecution. That's why it says in verse 3, And they laid hands on them, and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even time. But look at verse 18, And they called them. And commanded them that they should not, not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. In that verse 18, do you see persecution there? Of course, yes. The imprisonment was a little thing. Not only believers go to prison. And the imprisonment was just a so normal thing for people that societies don't agree with. And society will go and incarcerate them and put them. They are not fit for the society. Therefore, they put them there. Not only believers, there are other people there. The physical suffering in the persecution was small. But the greatest persecution somebody can put on you is to hinder you and limit you and shut up your mouth and not to preach the gospel. And so when he commanded them that they should not preach the gospel, that was a great persecution. And if they were able to endure the persecution of refinement, confinement, into a particular place, these other ones too that will shut up their mouth, they knew this was a greater persecution. And therefore they said in verse 19, Peter and John answered and said unto them, It's a people of power, political power. These were people that could take their lives. But he looked at them with courage and he said, in verse 19, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you judge that. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's the persecution. I pray that when your time comes, you will overcome. Look at what Jesus had said in chapter 15 of John. John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, here is what he says in verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, look at the word. They have persecuted me. They followed him to every city. You know sometimes there are people that they run from this city and they run to another city. And when you do that, you, are, you think that you know, Satan is here, Satan is instigating the people here, and therefore, since they are instigating them here, I'm going to run to another place. Your persecutors will recognize you are running away from them. You make them strong. And every time you run away from problem, you become weak. Every time you run away from an oppressor, a persecutor, you put power in his hand, and you become weak. Because you're running away and your spine will never be developed. 
and your courage will never be developed. But when there's persecution there, and the Lord wants you to be there, you stay in that same place. You know, it is when you go through those challenges and difficulties and pressures, you become strong. But you know, you are praying that, you know, if I go through this, this one might destroy. No, it doesn't destroy. It develops. And so you stay in that same place. In fact, your persecutors will be expecting that if we lay this on you and put this pressure on you and do this and that, you are likely to run away. But you know, there's Satan in the other place too. And there will be persecution, persecutors in the other place too. And since you didn't develop here, and you ran away from the persecution here, when that persecution comes over there, you're also going to run away from there. And then you run to another place again, and Satan is saying, this one is not intelligent enough to know that I'm here too. That he goes up and down and throw and fro in the world, and then he'll be monitoring, you know, what you're running from, and then exactly that thing you're running from, he comes, he has his people everywhere, he has his messengers everywhere, he has all those thoughts of persecutors everywhere, and they have the same thing, the same method, the same persecution, they time it very well. The devil orchestrates everything for you to understand that they are not the people doing it. He is the one doing it. Instead of running away from me, why don't you come back to where you were and say, now I learned my lesson. I thought that, you know, Satan is only here. I thought the person is only here. I've discovered that it's everywhere. And then you come back to the base and say, Satan, I've come back now. Now I've learned my lesson. And since I've come back now, you want to first go ahead and do it. And when Satan does that, he knows you've learned your lesson. And then when he does this, it doesn't work. He does that, he doesn't work. He does that, he doesn't work. You say, leave this one alone. There are other people like him that have not understood like he understands. Let's go to them. God will give you wisdom. Do not run away in Jesus' name. The Lord told them, they persecuted me. And they will persecute you. But in all those persecutions, you know, we have overcome already. I said we have overcome already. That's what you find in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and healing men and women, uh, com committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered, not that they left, not that they ran away. They were scattered. They were ejected out of their houses, out of their communities. They were literally driven out. But they had developed some spine and some courage and some conviction. And it says, when they were scattered like that, uh, they, they should understand. This, the reason for the persecution was the preaching of the word. That's why, Peter, that's why Saul went to every house and laid hands on them and he was taking them to the prison and scattering them and driving them away. But everywhere they went, what were they still doing? Tell me out loud. They were preaching the word. And that is what you are going to do everywhere you go in Jesus' name. That's why it says in verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. I'm looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And you are going to see what happened to these people. The persecution that they laid on them. But well, thank God they survived. We are going to survive. In the locations where you are, because you are a believer, because you are a preacher of the word of God, they are after you. But you know, until you finish your last bit of what God has committed into your hand, Nothing will stop that ministry in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians chapter 2, I read there from verse 14. It says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea and Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have, as they have of the Jews, of your own countrymen. You know, there are people that are telling us, look up here. You know, sometimes we will need to read the scriptures and understand. They are telling us that, you know, if you put, um, let's say, state of a sphere of a particular zone, make sure that it's a native of that zone, or zone. And therefore, if you put him there, 
there will be no consideration. And so that means that the, in Nigeria here, for illustration, we have some of our overseers from the Southwest. They say, all the overseers from Southwest, let them stay in Southwest. And they say, all the overseers in Southeast, let them stay in Southeast. Don't allow any Southeast overseer in any other part. You know why? So that there will be no persecution. And then all the overseers of the Northeast, let them be indigenous of the Northeast. All the overseers of the Northwest, let them be indigenous of the Northwest. And they say, if we can do that, then there will be no persecution. Everybody will be preaching the gospel, and they will be able to win this nation for the Lord. Come on now, and read verse 14. And read it intelligently, and read it with understanding, and understand where the persecution here is coming from. And also remember that Jesus was a Jew, and the Jews persecuted him. And the disciples, the apostles, they were Jews, and the Jews persecuted them. I remember Stephen, he was a Jew, and the Jews persecuted him. And remember that all those people in Jerusalem that were scattered abroad and they went everywhere, they were Jews and Jews persecuted them. And now we come to this in chapter 2 verse 14. For ye, for ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea and Christ Jesus, for ye also have suffered like sins of who? Tell me out loud. If they were Southeast people in our country, they were persecuted by Southeast people. If they were Northeast in our country, they were persecuted by Northeastern people. If they were Southwest, they were persecuted by Southwestern people. That's what he's saying. That you're persecuted of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. That means then it's not like, you know, they tell us to reorganize our church and you know, put only this one here, only that one here, only that one there, so that there will be no persecution. Persecution would always be there. If we're preaching the truth and we're standing on the word of righteousness, that's the reason why sometimes you have to explain all this is because there are some people that are agitating. Give us our man. Give us our man. Who is your man? He is my man too. All the, all the overseers, they are my men, and they are, you know, they are my disciples, and they are my children, they are my students, and I'm training them. And anyway, we need them. That's why we're going to put them in Jesus' name. In a good amen. And we don't want to be political in our church, and you know, politics trying to come in and say that, you know, don't worry, we'll vote for you, and you will be there. Then if you are the people that appointed them, they are not under my leadership, they are not under my instruction, they are not under my supervision. It's like, you know, you appointed them, and then they will be pleasing you. They will not please the Lord, they will not listen to me. That's very dangerous for you as a church. And so, wherever we are, and whatever we're doing, when the Lord says, they this is where we are. That's where we're going to be. But you know, the pastor has sent me here, and he knows that there's going to persecution there. How can he send me there? Aye, but if you are in your place, persecution too will come. A different kind of persecution could have be more terrible than the one you are you're going to have in that other place. Let's just uh, give ourselves to the Lord, and I pray that as we do that, nothing will shake our convictions in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Of course, persecutions will be there. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us and called us. And you will be more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation give me an answer? Or distress? Of persecution, of famine, of nakedness, of peril of sword, as it is written for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, 
which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You want to say an amen? amen. Nothing will separate us in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now is the prayer for boldness and power. The prayer for boldness and power. You see, when the challenge came on them, they didn't say, this choice we have made, this commitment we made, this consecration we made, to preach the word of the Lord. Yes, he told us there will be persecution, but we didn't pray to be this thought. He told us there will be persecution. We didn't know it will be this continuous. We didn't know that it will just persist and persist and persist. He said that all he said was, oh Lord, give us boldness. Give us courage. When the Lord is heavier, give us a stronger backbone, a stronger spine. And give us some strong feet and put some iron shoes in our feet so that we'll be able to match on all those things and we'll be effective, we'll be prevailing, and we will overcome. That's what they prayed for. Look at Acts again, chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. And I'm reading there from verse 28 and 29. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel, determine before to be done. And now, Lord, behold, they are threatened, and grant unto thy servants, that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Did God answer them? I said, did God answer them? Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled for the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with what? The boldness, their boldness. Moses needed boldness in the sight of Pharaoh. Joshua needed boldness of those Canaanites. David needed boldness before Saul and also Goliath. Jeremiah needed boldness in the midst of the Jewish people that were being taken captive to Babylon and the false prophets too. And Ezekiel needed boldness because the Lord said that they're like thorns and briars, but I've sent you unto them. And Daniel needed boldness before all those presidents that were conspiring against him. And the Lord Jesus Christ had need of boldness in the land, in the nation of Israel. And these apostles and disciples needed boldness. And that's what they prayed for. And where you are ministering, you need boldness and courage. If, if you're looking for an easy field of evangelization where there will be no problem, no persecution, and then you're writing to the headquarters, things are tough. Yeah, of course, even the Jews is at all as we're preaching the gospel. But it is a prayer. It is not checking out and you know going off and say I cannot stay there again. If you faint in the day of adversity and persecution, your strength is small. And the reason, the way you can increase that strength is to go and wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And when you come out of that prayer chamber, you'll be as bold as a lion in Jesus' name. But nothing will threaten you anymore. In fact, you know that you know this day is going to come, and next week is going to come, and next month is going to come. And because you know it's going to come, just like as students who are in, in school, and they still study, they knew that testing time will come. There's no doubt about that. And because they knew testing time will come, that's the reason they study. But you know, they don't just study this and that. They study things that are relevant to the test that will come. You ask any of our children when they're studying and preparing for exam, and there are a lot of other things they could read. They are not going to read all those other things. They're going to read things that will prepare them for the test and the exam ahead of them. The same thing with believers. When you know that persecution will come and challenges will come, I know that the pressure will come. There are many, many things you can read. You can read about this, about this, about that. But then, you know, this is where you are. And this is the kind of challenge that will come. And this is the kind of persecution that will come. You will read, you will study, you will pray, you will prepare yourself 
in line with what is coming. And when you do that, you are going to be an overcomer in Jesus' name. They pray for boldness and Jesus and the Lord answered their prayer and give them boldness. And uh, look at Paul the Apostle. You know, I was surprised uh, when I read this. Of course, I've read it before, but I've been reading it again and preparing the message that Peter, Paul of all people, because Paul, Paul was this bold fellow that even when they put him in prison, instead of crying and whining and complaining, and more, I didn't know it to be this hard. The Lord told me that I'll go through some things. I didn't know it to be this hard. But he began to sing with uh, Silas and Paul. They were singing. And then when they were singing, the prison doors, you know, the story, they were open and the shackles were taken away. And then the prison foundation was shaking. And then at the end, the following day after the prison, you know, gave his life to the Lord with the whole family. He sent and said, Send to those people, Paul and Silas, tell them, we we'll release them and they can go. And Paul said, Me, those people sent for me to just go. You go tell them I am here until I see them. They will have to come and take me out of this place. Otherwise, I'm not going out of prison. Think, think about a man like that. I, I, I don't think you are like that, but you will become like that. But when there's persecution, there's imprisonment, there's pressure, and they will send to you and say, okay, because of the pressure what you're feeling there, we will not talk it is. And just because of that, not because of any other, can we transfer you out of this place? And you say, sir, if it is only because of the pressure, I'm enjoying it. In fact, I'm growing some wings now. I'm growing some back pro now. I'm having some kind of strength I didn't have before. Now, leave me here. I want to be here. I want to see more of this. That's the kind of person Paul the Apostle was. And I pray that God will put something in your spine in your backbone that you'll be able to stand in the midst of those challenges in jesus name but the surprising thing the surprising thing that paul could ask for prayer to be bold i said what you're bold already he said yes greater challenges are coming i need greater boldness he said greater things and pressures are coming and i need something greater so that i'll be able to whatever challenge comes and whatever may be what the devil will try to do that boldness will increase when the challenges increase then the grace will increase when the pressures increase then the grace will increase and when all those things will increase in our lives the grace of god the power Power of the Lord and the strength of the Lord will increase in our lives in Jesus' name. It's just like when we were in the primary school, our test was this small, and then our knowledge was just like that. As we went on in life from school to school, from class to class, then our test became upgraded and higher. Our trials became higher, our persecution became higher, and because they became higher, our knowledge too was increasing. Our ability too was increasing. Our confidence too was increasing. When the boldness remains at the same level, if challenges become greater, if persecution becomes greater, you will fail and fall. And you say, but I have courage. Yes, it was the courage of yesterday. It was the courage of last year. And the courage of yesteryears will only match the persecution of yesteryears. But when the challenges increase, our God is still there. I said our God is still there. And He will give you all the boldness and the courage you need in Jesus' name. That's why now Paul, the Apostle Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading there from verse 19. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. And it says, and for me, I was talking about prayer, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds and that therein I may speak boldly the second time he says that as I ought to speak he said I want you church to pray for me that as the challenges increase my boldness will increase my courage will increase and my conviction will remain firm I will remain firm to the very end in Jesus name you see, that's why those leaders and members of the church they came together to pray. They were united in faith and united in purpose. And when you know the challenge that is before us, and they were united in faith and united in purpose, their lives were in danger. 
and the eternal destiny of millions of people was at stake. All those persecutors did not understand that they thought it was a local thing, were persecuting Paul, were persecuting the apostles, and they thought it was a local thing, but it made the destiny of millions of people in that generation and in the coming generations to our generation, our destiny to be at stake. You know, if they were able to silence Peter, you not have all those two epistles of Peter? And if they were able to silence John, you not have the book of Revelation, and then all these through them, if they were able to silence Paul the Apostle, all those Pauline epistles you not be able to have. And it was going to derail or destroy the destiny of the people in their generation and the people in the coming generation. That's why Paul the Apostle said, we cannot afford to be sh to shake in our conviction, in our boldness, and we cannot afford to give in or to give up. We must keep on, and you'll keep on in Jesus' name. Only the power of God could overcome all those persecutions. That's why they prayed and they said, "And now, Lord, behold, their threat is because they reminded." Reminded the Lord that the threatenings were not against them, but against God, and against Christ is anointed, and against His will, and against the counsel, and His kingdom. The creatures conspired against the Creator. The persecution was not merely to prevent the success of their preaching, but it was to bring to naught God's eternal counsel and God's eternal plan. That's why they called God into the scene, and they said, Lord, see what they are doing. They're trying to make you a liar. They're trying to say that what you plan for the compassion of the Jews and the compassion of the Gentiles will not happen. You know, when you persecute ministers of God, you want them to shut up and you want them to hold on, you want them to step back, you want them to uh, kind of pack their load and run away. You're not just, uh, you know, destroying that man. Of course, you destroy the man if he yields for that. And you're not just oppressing that man. You are hindering the, pos the, the possibility of millions of people getting saved and then when you do that your locality you do that in any other place and you're not just uh, you might be enjoying yourself that you know because you know wicked people they enjoy when other people suffer when other people are oppressed when other people are under pressure but you're not just uh, you know hindering that person you are hindering the salvation of millions of people that's why they said, Lord, look at this, because this is going to hinder your purpose, and this is going to hinder your counsel, your eternal counsel. And he said, Lord, we don't want that to be done. We'll rather die and give our lives to have the fulfillment of the counsel of God and the plan of God. But if we're going to die, we need boldness. You know, you cannot just volunteer to die if you don't have boldness. Everybody is running away from death. The only people that run towards death are the people who are bold. And you're going to be bold in Jesus' name. That's why they prayed and God answered their prayers. And that's why we're going to pray. And God is going to answer our prayers in Jesus' name. And in all those places where persecution is coming to a great height, we're going to have greater conversions in Jesus' name. In all those places where the pressure and where the assault is becoming very great, in any land, in this continent or beyond this continent, the people of God, in fact, we're going to multiply the workers who are there. Give me a good amen. I didn't get ready. Why are you in a congress like this? Maybe you're in the south here and you know, and then we're saying that uh, you're reading the papers. Of course, I'm sure you don't believe everything you read in those papers because, you know, those, uh, whatever you read, whoever is writing a political leaning, so has its own kind of, uh, you know, traditional leanings or religious leanings, and when they write, they lead towards, uh, you know, their perspectives. But whatever it is that you're reading, you're not thinking about this is tough and this is difficult. You're rising up in those same places where the challenges are. You know, if it were not, uh, if it were not for the fact that I have to be, you know, around here and around that other place, I would even move my base myself and go to those places and say, now, you children, here I am. Where are you? Who are going to follow me? Where are you? I'm asking you now. Who are going to follow me? Where are you? Ah, no hand. You are prayed. Praise the Lord. You will follow in Jesus' name. And you know, when we go there, in fact, there's no time for me this morning to tell, to show you this. They, they wanted to kill Jesus. Where is he? Where is he? And then when they wanted to kill him, persecution, they said, this time, finish. We're going to catch him this time. And then they were in the feast and they were looking. Where is he? Where is he? All of a sudden, the person they want to kill, he showed up. 
And when he showed up, the point to arrive, then we'll finish him this week. Then he was already preaching to all the people. Then all the people, is this not the man they wanted to kill? See how he's speaking boldly and nobody has touched him. And his people to arrest him, they were there. And then they listened. After they listened, not only one, what do you think? This man is talking from heaven. How about you? I'm convicted. How about you? I can't talk. Then they went back. And when they went back, they said, did you see him? Of course we saw him. Where is he? Why didn't you bring him? They said, by the time we got there, he was talking already. And no man ever spoke like that man. The person you know is Moses, but I'm telling you, that man is higher than Moses. They said, you two, have you become his disciple? And then they ran, catch him, catch him. And Jesus just walked majestically in the midst of the people who wanted to catch him, and they couldn't catch him. They will not catch you. I said they will not catch you. Hey, people are afraid. What am I going to do? Just keep on preaching. We're going to keep on preaching in Jesus' name. If you don't have a trouble, if you don't have persuasion, come and see me after. I'll lend you some. A pastor wants to say, you need some persecution, you need some challenges because you're going to be weak and you're going to be sloppy, you're going to be flabby. They come to me after and say, Pastor, you said, you know, you're going to give me persuasion. I said, I can give you some. Then I, you know, put the pair and send you to a particular place. Not like the, what David did to the husband of uh, Bathsheba. I said, put his husband there. I'm not going to kill you, but you're going to, you're going to be strengthened when you get there. And I'm telling you, this church, we're marching on in Jesus' name. And, and you know, we who are leaders, state of us here, nation of us here, if the same thing that happens and then you run, all your people will run. They will see that when the head is not there and the head is running for its life, what am I going to do? And then they vacate everything and then the enemies will come and destroy everything you have built all these years but will not run away from any persecutor. Because we are even, we are the very soul of the possibility of their salvation. How could they get saved and get to heaven? Their eternal destiny depends on us. How can we run away from them? We're not going to run away from them in Jesus' name. Because we're going to keep on preaching these truths until the final day, until the Lord calls us home. There's nothing in our spine that is talking of timidity or fearfulness or, you know, standing back and thinking we cannot do something. We're going to do it as they did it in Jesus' name. Point number three now is the preaching with boldness during persecution. That's the time to preach. That's the time to preach with boldness with authority and with power, with anointing and unction. Preaching with boldness during the time of persecution. During persecution. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. And I'm reading here from verse 31. Acts chapter 4. Verse 31. And when they had preached, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And it says, and they were, what? Tell me, all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they speak the word with boldness. Look at verse 33. And with great power. Give the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace. Everybody say great grace. Everybody say great grace. Great grace was upon them all. It's upon you this morning. I said it's upon you this morning. Look at Acts chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so speak and so speak and, and so speak. That is, they spoke with such a clarity and with such conviction and with such courage and boldness that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews church of the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. You see, persecution came in verse 2. Look at the result in verse 3. Long time therefore, long time therefore, abode they speaking 
boldly in the Lord. And you understand the situation here in verse 1, they preach, and they preach with conviction, and with courage, and with assurance, and certainty, and confidence, and then many people came to know the Lord, and the Jews heard, and the Jews came there, it was a Gentile territory, and they started off the Gentiles for more persecution, and when the persecution was there, did they run out of town? I said, did they run out of town? Look at it in verse 3. Long time, therefore. Ah, Paul the Apostle said, in fact, we wanted to just spend a short time here before. Now that the persecution is there, because of that persecution, long time, therefore, they are bold there. And they were speaking boldly in the name of the Lord, which gave testimony unto the world of His grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. In those same places where you are, where you are challenged, in those same places where you are facing persecution, we are going to have more signs and wonders in that place in Jesus' name. And you are going to say, because of this persecution, because of this challenge, because of the opposition to the divine truth we are bringing, we are even going to emphasize that divine truth more. And we are going to stay here and nothing is going to take us away from the ministry the Lord has given us in Jesus' name. If you are in agreement, where are you? I said, if you are in agreement, where are you? They will stand up then and say, long time there, for long time there, for long time there, for they are both there, I am going to abide there. I'll stay at my post, even I have to die in my post, I'm going to do that. And God has said, help you to raise up a walk in a particular place, and then the people are challenging you and saying, what are you doing here? We're going to take you out of, we're going to run you out of town. We're going to run you out of town. Then you say, long time, therefore, long time, therefore, long time, therefore, abroad in that place, we're going to abide there. And it means that you're not going to allow yourself to be like chicken. You're not going to allow yourself to be like a cow. You're not going to allow yourself to be like somebody else that has any spine, any backbone. You say, because of that, I'm going to pray to have more courage, and more boldness, and more stability. And I'm going to do what the Lord has called me to do. The Lord will do that in your life. Just give your life to us. Say, oh Lord, here am I. Oh Lord, here am I. I am going to stand in your word. I'm not going to run from that, whether it is northeast or northwest, or whether it is middle belt, or it is uh, southwest, or it is uh, south south, or it is southeast, or it is central Africa, or southern Africa, or north Africa, or east Africa, or it is in Europe, or it is America, or it is Canada, or it is in Asia, or it is in India, or it is China. Anywhere the Lord has planted your feet and said there's ministry here, there's a work to do there, even in the Middle East, you are saying, oh Lord, here am I, long time, therefore, both day in that place, declaring the word of truth and the word of life and the word of God. It will not be because your persecution is there and they don't uh, accept me anymore, you don't want to give in to me anymore. And those of us are the headquarters here, you know, when the challenge is, you know, don't run away from the headquarters. If you have ministry in another place, uh, that's alright, but not because of persecution, because of opposition. Then they run away from the foundation that you have laid. And then you cannot stay there again because somebody is trying to kind of unseat you. Say, never. You are going to abide there. Give your life to the Lord and say, Lord, I give it to you again. Even if you have to sacrifice it. Even if you have to die. I will die at my post. Tell the Lord, long time abode there, therefore.